and welcome to Clamp, the weekly podcast where we talk about all things related to creating, living, and making projects. I'm your host, Grant Alexander, and joining me as always is Morley Kurt and Adam Mackey. Today, we were talking about lingo. What do I mean by lingo? Well, good thing you asked, because it's the words that you need to use in order to get projects done or to market your project or basically to feel comfortable doing things. Um, I To start this off, I'll talk about the first time I went to buy wood at the uh, hardwood store here in uh, Ottawa, KJP Select. I went there and I... I didn't know what I was looking for. I'd done some Googling on like, oh, it's sold in five quarters and you need to know different things. Um, and I just kind of like, I went in there and I was overwhelmed. Um, it just seemed like there was a lot of stuff happening there and and I just didn't know what to do and I didn't know the right questions to ask. And, and luckily, the person uh, that I dealt with there, uh, Derek, he was very uh, good at asking the right questions so that I could, he could gear me towards buying the right stuff. Um, so that I, you know, he'd ask, do you have a, you know, what tools do you have? What, what are you planning to use with this? Do you need dressed lumber versus like dressed lumber? What do you mean dressed? Like, does it have a dress on it? Like, this is all confusing lingo. Balsamic vinaigrette. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 so it's all that kind of stuff that I go, well, you know, I need to understand. I was like, well, I have a, I have a planer and a table saw. And he's like, okay, well, then we'll get you some, you know, rough lumber. And I'll save you some money and blah, blah, blah. And it was all this kind of lingo that the first time you go and do something, if, you, if you're not in a trade and you're doing it as a hobby, you come across lingo that you may not know. And it might even stop you from trying a project. And so I thought I'd ask you guys what – experiences you've had with this and how you've overcome them. Yeah, I think to start, the first thing that comes to mind for me is finding the right words for things when I'm making a video. And I think mm. when I first started my channel, I was doing my engineering degree. And I think I just gravitated towards a lot of engineering language. I would, I think I said like sheer strength and in other, you know, engineering terms in my videos, just cause like, that's what I was doing all day, every day at the time. I think I felt smart for, for saying those things. And I felt like it was unique about me, but I think in a lot of ways it made my videos less relatable and more sort of like buttoned up than I think I want them to be now. I think since then I've tried to be more like colloquial in my language or, or not try to be, you know, put on a, uh, a front of like trying to be academic about something when it's needlessly so. Um, so yeah, I think thinking back and, or, or just like talking about, you know, the size of the screw when it doesn't matter. I think having watched, watched a lot of maker videos, it seems like people were very diligent in talking about all the hardware they were using. And then looking back at some of those older videos, I'm like, there is no reason for me to like, to say that it's just extra words, you know, for no reason. So I think in some ways using the right lingo can, can be a barrier. Cause it, you know, I like trying to communicate in a way that's clear. I don't know if I always come across that way, but I think the quote, like right lingo can sometimes get in the way of that. And I think some of like my favorite communicators that I watch or listen to, no matter the medium or subject, use a lot of colloquial language and it makes it very accessible to listen to. I agree a hundred percent. It makes it way more accessible, but it doesn't help when you want to go to the store and get the thing with the right shear strength. And you're saying, you know, the one that does this, this, uh, the, uh, the, it's like, it doesn't fall apart when it, it's uh, sliding yeah. against each other. And the guy's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Do you mean shear strength? And you're like, I don't know what that term means. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Like those are like the, in shear strength, something you actually need to know if you build decks, which is a common thing that lots of people do. You need to understand why screws are not good at shear strength versus nails, unless you get the proper screws that are made for shear strength. 
mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. I was on a deck once. Uh, we were all, uh, it was like a, it was St. Patrick's Day. And I went out to my buddy's house in Arm Prior. And we're all, we all piled out onto the deck because it was one of those beautiful March days, which in Canada doesn't happen very often, where the sun was shining and it was like 10 degrees and everyone's having a, you know, a party. And we go out on the deck and there's probably a couple too many people and the deck just fell off the house. Oh my God. Now it was only like one of these, like, like, I don't know, two steps up deck, right? Like it was, it's like more like an extended tiny staircase, but it just boom. And everyone like freaks out. And it was because the person had used deck screws, which are meant to hold down the board and not hold it against thing. It didn't have the sheer strength, but he didn't know the lingo, didn't know what to, questions to ask. Hmm. He was building he a deck. A deck and was like, oh, that's for a deck. Right. <laughs> yeah. But my, um, one of my good mates, he just got this like deck and staircase built out the front of his house. And I don't know what underneath the deck looks like underneath the decking, but all the decking is held down with chipboard screws. And this, like this guy's a tradie. He's like, you know, I can do it. Like I'm, you know, I'm a professional. I know like not my mate. He hired someone to do it. And I'm like, this is like wrong. Like these are just going to lift and they already are starting to lift. They're like, it's like a month or two old. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm going to come along and we're going to fix this. So we're going to replace every screw with decking screws. Cause this is ridiculous. Like they're just going to snap over time. Right. You know, the yeah. shear strength is not made for that. Well, I think and it's probably the wrong cor- like corrosion thing, but that's a lot of like a screw is a screw until it needs to do a certain thing. And that's yeah. where the lingo comes in on why but, it but matters. That's the thing. You take like a chipboard screw, which is made to hold like a wall, like the chipboard to a wall or whatever it's not made to like have constant beating on it. Whereas like a deck you're walking on it, you're constantly pushing, you're flexing the boards in between the two screws. That's going to make them move up and down and lift and break. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think one of my main experiences in this was when I was working at the scenery shop and, you know, I'd be talking to other carpenters and they would be describing how we were going to put up a row of flats or something. And, for one, they would just like use terminology, which I hadn't heard before. Like people were talking about whalers for weeks and I had no idea what they were talking about until we actually got to the convention center where we were doing the install. And I learned that a whaler is basically like a piece of wood that holds up um, like a long wall and you attach it to like a solid column or something. Oh. And there's, there's all these terminology in the scenery industry and in the theater industry and in TV that I just had never been exposed to before. So a lot of it, you kind of just like take for granted. I think I learned that for sure in my university degree, which was if you don't understand something, take it for granted and know that you'll learn it later on. So just assume it to be true. What would happen if this thing were true? And let's just keep going and keep working, assuming that I know what this means, which works a lot of the time, especially if you don't need to know why exactly you're doing something. Like if you were doing production carpentry, which I was doing at the time. But I found it very difficult to understand like carpenters talking about how we were going to build something. Maybe it was because I'm just like a visual learner, but people would be like, yeah, we're going to, okay, so we'll take this strip. We'll put another one on top of it, smack them together and then do this and put this on top and, and we'll button it all up together. I was like, I have no idea what you're trying to say to me right now. (laughs) And I feel like there's this very specific way that like carpenters speak sometimes that just doesn't go through to me. And it's maybe, maybe it's because I, I don't have the experience or, or it's just because I need to see it. But yeah, that was, that was difficult for sure. I'd say it's a mix of both. Like every industry has their own lingo. Like if I started talking to you in the lingo of like at my work, you'd have no idea what I'm talking about. We have um, a little bit of a tangent. We, we have this on the trains. They have what we call Cox, which is like a tap along like an airline or, or whatever like that that you can just turn on or off i think that's a pretty common term in engineering and then the side of the train that we have like the panel we can lift up on hinges to access it is called a skirt so like all through school we're saying like lift the skirt pull the cock (laughs) and like but people outside of like my industry would be like what the hell are they talking about yeah Mm -hmm. sounds sounds like you're more talking about some sort of porno exactly 
exactly. But that's right. it's it's, a, it's the industry. Like the carpentry is going to have their own terms for certain things and, and and all that sort of stuff. To bring it back a little bit to the, the question you asked originally, I haven't really had any experience with shops other than Bunnings, like the your Home Depot or big box store. Um, but in saying that, I think in Australia, it's very common for people to like build their own houses and, and all that sort of stuff that growing up through school and that, I think all that sort of like dress timber and everything was taught to me already. Right. So I haven't, I haven't really had anything in that comfort zone that I haven't really known, but then I am starting to see that now with like metal work and stuff. Like I don't know anything I'm talking about when it comes to like metal pipe and all that. Well, even when you got your CNC, you were talking about tramming. Right. Yeah. Did you know what that was beforehand? No idea. Right. So it's a thing yeah. that if someone said, well, did you tram it? You'd say, I don't even know what that means. That word what? doesn't have a, a meaning to me. And that's the lingo of CNC yeah. that, that if you know it, you should know it. Yeah. Right? Well, even like I'm in a Facebook group for my CNC and people were like, oh, why is my cut doing this? And it's like, you can tell their CNC needs to be trimmed. And someone will say, you need to trim your CNC. And they're like, what the hell is that? Right. Yeah. So it's funny. I remember Jeremy makes stuff was talking in the discord about leveling a CNC and, um, yeah. and he was talking like he saw people taking a spirit level out, which I always just call the level, but a lot of people call them spirit levels to yeah. understandably denote them from every other level out there. So putting a spirit <laughs> level on their CNC bed and, and adjusting the screws to make it level. Oh my right? God. Which, understandably um, makes sense. If someone says level it, you would put it down there and you would level it the way you've always leveled things. So I just think it's that, it's that lingo that you, I I think it's a big thing comes down to uh, two, two things that come into my mind is, is trying to teach people things and trying to market things. And I think Mm -hmm. you had a really good point morally about when the lingo can, can bring you down is when you're trying to, you're trying to a, either teach people something that they don't need to know, and you're trying to dig, bring up the your you know sheer force factor. That's what I'm going to call it from now on. <laughs> uh, or you know it can bring you down when uh, because you don't become relatable. But it can also when you need to you need to know when you need to know it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to say that like with the, with the video, for instance, it depends on what sort of videos you want to make. Like you, if we watch one of your videos, we, we know what a screw is and what does what, like we have that experience. But if you have someone that has never built a thing in their life, watch your video, they need to know you need to use this sort of sort of screw or that sort of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, it depends on the type of video you want to make. If you want to make the, the video where a beginner that's never touched a tool can make the project you're making. Mm-hmm. That sort of stuff is important. Yeah, it's something I come up against a fair bit when I'm teaching the woodworking class. Because I'll, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to have like mini lessons at the beginning of the class more often now, rather than just have everyone go and start on their project. Because they're they're all very self motivated and they know what step they're on. But when they do that, it's very easy for the kids to start picking up bad techniques because no one's ever showed them the right way to do something. And if you don't catch them at the exact right moment, then it's kind of too late. I mean, they're learning through experience, which is a good thing in and of itself, but like, you know, they're not going to know intuitively about sanding through the grains. So like something like that is something that I'll try to gather the class for like a minute at the very beginning and say, so when we're sanding today, like we're going to sand through the grains. What does that mean? We're going to start with 80 grit and then move to 120, then 220. And by doing that, we're going to get this really beautiful, smooth finish. And in those moments, I can definitely, there's ways to dumb things down and say it in more colloquial ways. But I think it's also kind of good sometimes to try to just like, use the correct word with an audience and not like assume that they don't know what it means and be like, yeah, like it's good to challenge people, especially kids. Like when you're teaching them, they can figure it out from context clues and treat them a little smarter and more capable rather than, you know, dumber. And they like, they need to have their hand held at every step of the way. So you said sand through the grains and I've never heard it say that way. Sand through the grits. I've always heard it Sorry, say sand. Okay. 
<laughs> so Morley hasn't slept. Um, so yeah, that's that's coming out now. <laughs> Morley's too busy pottying for his birthday. Uh, all Not that entirely d- wrong. I, I've got a little <laughs> an aside here. Something that I learned recently: when you change the number in the grit, you should add it fifty percent. That should be your next number. Okay. That's the rule of thumb. Because there's there's tons of grits, tons of different grit numbers, right? You can oh, get so like don't go. Right. So if you were at 40, go to 60. That's adding 50%. If you're at 60, what's the next number? Well, it'd be 90. But 100. So you go 100 or you, or you do 80, 80, right? The, the you do the, so then you just you try and add 50% for your next one. That way you don't so, end up so doing you too go, much. So you go like 100 to 150, not to 120. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Nice. That's a fun little interesting tip. Uh, that can help it's that way you don't end up doing too many steps. It doesn't hurt to do too many, but you can also skip good. Oh, I went from 80 to 240. And you're like, well, you went too far. Right. Anyways, right. That's an aside. It's something that uh, I learned from my growth rings. Um, on one that's of interesting. Videos. Cause I, I would always go 40, 120, 240. I double right. it. You use 40 grit sandpaper. I do at times. Yeah. I don't think I've ever even seen 40 grit sandpaper. I you know what I can't find is 3000 grit. I can't find anything above 1200. I and it's want, driving me insane. I go to Amazon, get shipped to my mm-hmm. door next day. But yeah, we don't have that. That was the, uh, the aside. Let's get us back onto the lingo. Because I, at one point, looked into, after high caliber camp, there's two things I looked into. A little bit into like knife m- metal. And I got completely confused because they started talking about carbon, high carbon steels and blah, blah, blahs. And, and I just went like, people are making knives that are perfectly acceptable out of, you know, like leaf springs. And people are making mm-hmm. knives that are perfectly acceptable out of like the perfect steel. And I just go, I don't know. I can't tell the difference. I know there's a difference. And I know it's like edge holding strength and stuff like that. And I think you can, you can overwhelm yourself with the lingo Mm -hmm. early on to the point where you discourage yourself from doing something. And that's what I didn't want to end up doing. But I think that it becomes like this, like this incessant problem on the internet where somebody knows something and tries to throw that lingo at you. Like, you know, I don't know. Like, yeah, that's I think some 10, people ten twenty four steel, and you're like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think some people also get like a satisfaction or superiority complex out of like using words that other people don't know, or, or maybe I think, I think it also. I'm, I don't want to like throw anyone under the bus or anything. I don't know the guy, but say like Alex Steel, for instance, who might watch someone make some make a knife out of a leaf spring, and he knows you really should be using like this metal because this will happen and this and this. Whereas someone like me who knows nothing about knife making, just sees someone make a knife and go, that's really cool. Right. So if you don't know better, you to like, it's not an issue what you're using, what the person's using. Well, the problem is people think they know better because they heard someone say, you always need to use X yeah. because they didn't understand the entire context of why you always need to use X and why yeah. one way is not better than the other, right? Mm-hmm. And if a knife cuts, then it does its job, right? <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is that me using MDF instead of plywood is not that big of a deal. Right. I just like to give you crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. But as we talked about today, there's a massive price difference. So too bad. Right. I- if, if it was – so MDF and plywood are the same price for me. So I would have – I could never once in my life see myself going, I'm going to pick the MDF option for anything. Yeah. But anyway, that's, I now, that's nothing to after, do. Nope. After realizing how expensive MDF is there, I now understand why people don't use it. But over here, it is a very cheap option. That's why everyone uses it. And it makes yeah. a lot more – like if, if, if they were the same price, I would never touch MDF. Okay, it's, I know you want to get back to the topic, Grant, but just to stay on this for a moment longer. You know how like most construction goods have like a standard purpose, right? So like a two by four 
eight foot long two by four is for framing interior walls and eight foot long two by six is for framing exterior walls. OSB is normally used for like sheathing houses or whatever. What is like the Mm -hmm. intended or most common use of MDF? Is it building speaker enclosures? I would say, I'd say for, for DIY standards, I'd probably say for speaker enclosures, but I think MDF would be more used in the, um, like mass production, like Ikea and stuff personally. I don't know. Table, table tops. There's a lot of MDF tabletops because it accepts a veneer very well. So you can put Mm, like Formica on top of it and then, I don't know. I feel like Like, Ikea is There's a lot of MDF plywood. Got, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, like M- MDF I, So board. Ikea, Ikea makes like three different ranges of furniture. They make the particle board bullshit that everyone complains about. That's garbage. And it is. It's complete and garbage, but it's $10 for like a dining table. And you're like, well, it's $10, so I don't care if it's garbage. Right? Yeah. And then they also make like $1,500 dining tables. Yeah. And they're made out of solid wood. Yeah. A lot and, of people in and- Europe – Outfit there, we'll get IKEA kitchens, and they're really nice. I I have an yeah, IKEA have kitchen too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but then the IKEA kitchens are actually like the mid range because they're just they're made out of uh, there's a lot of MDF and uh, particle board and plywood in them. It's really funny because gotcha. when I think of like IKEA kitchen, I just assume it's their cheap furniture version. Like it, we don't. I've I've never really seen like hardwood tables at IKEA. Or solid wood tables. It's all flat pack. That was that's the whole point of IKEA. So it, I thought was a cheap flat pack. It's, you can be flat pack and solid. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't think I've ever seen it. I don't, I, don't get me wrong; it probably is there, and I've just never noticed. But I don't know. Yeah, I feel maybe IKEA yeah. is different here. Yeah, but thinking about the lingo, things even like flat pack. If someone says to you flat pack. It's lingo you may never have heard, and you can likely from the the terminology figure it out. But there are some times when terminology actually leads you down the wrong route. Um, and I thought I had an example of that, but now I've lost it. So I'm going to go over to you guys to hopefully you have like a, a, a false like thing that, that the lingo actually made you think something and it was actually the opposite or something completely different. Well, to go back to what you're saying with the particle board, particle board and chipboard, I found are two different things, which right. is interesting because I always called particle board chipboard. I thought they were the same thing. And then I did some research and found out that chipboard is actually pretty much as strong as plywood, if not stronger. Can be. So that's oriented strand board is as strong, almost as strong as plywood. Depends on how yeah, you're talking well, about we, we Oriented it, strong board. We call it chipboard. No, that's a different thing. So chip doesn't mm-hmm. orient the strands. So this is the lingo. But okay, so OSB has a greater shear strength, which is funny that that's the oh, yeah, particular OSB one that more perfect, that, so. than, than plywood does. Um, but for every other way, plywood is stronger. But yeah. chipboard but actually doesn't, isn't oriented. OSB was particle board. It's made up of particles, but yeah, they're strands and oriented. That. Yeah. But this is, this is my point, though. Like with the lingo, like I, I never knew that they were different things. I thought OSB was particle board, and then I looked it up on Google, and it's like OSB is just as strong as plywood. And I'm like, oh, so I could just buy cheap particle board, thinking it was the same thing. And then I came to discover it's not. Yeah, because they look the same, like other than it's bigger chips. Right. Yeah, I think I think a big like a real life issue what comes up here is when you have to start communicating with other people like we're doing here. Like Eden is notorious for saying right when she means left, especially when we're driving. And it's like, it's fine if you mix up your own rights and lefts, but if you're telling me how to get somewhere, like you can't do it. (laughs) It doesn't work. (laughs) So I think at at those points, knowing the lingo is very valuable. I I think I honestly, I think if you were talking about like terminology for, figuring out finding products and knowing what to make. I think if you're just less self-conscious about how you come across, it it makes it not matter quite as much, especially if you're shopping. I mean, I found that in most stores that I went to, if you just talk to the storekeepers as like a fellow human and you just tell them what you need, most of the times people are are pretty gracious. 
a hundred percent. I find it's difficult when I'm trying to find it online. True. So yeah. an an example of that, I was looking for curtain rods for my uh, my bowler, and there were seven sixteenths inch, um, which curtain rods are half inch. Cafe rods are seven sixteenths. So I was getting fancy. almost nothing, nothing for curtain rods. And I was like, this is bullshit. I have some. They're just brass, and I just don't want brass ones. I just want to find some non-brass ones, right? And I was like, no, there's nothing. And I was like, this is just straight up bullshit. And then eventually, I went through like Google page number three and it said cafe rods. And I started searching that up, and then all of a sudden, everything came up. Yeah, I went like, this is a stupid lingo thing that shouldn't have have brought me down to the third page of Google. I shouldn't have got there. Yeah. Well, that, that that's interesting. So we were talking earlier today about like sheets of plywood and stuff. You if you go to like Home Demo, Home Depot website or something, can you just type in like full sheet plywood and it will bring up a full sheet, or do you have to put in dimensions? Uh it depends. I've never tried. The Home Depot search like, functionality I find is pretty good. Like you don't usually have to write like inch and foot symbols, and if you add extra yeah. spaces, it's pretty forgiving. Whereas on so, Amazon, I find it's not that way. Right. If I So if I go to Bunnings, right? So I'll look up like sheet of plywood. I'll type in like 2,400 by 1,200 plywood and I'll get nothing. But if I type 2,440 by 1,220 plywood, I'll get results. And it drives me insane. Yeah. Like, just well, those the, two numbers. The Bunnings website is bad. I was on there earlier today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and in saying that, I, I also wanted to quickly touch on Bunnings and Home Depot. So, when you go to Home Depot, do people know, like the people that work there, do they know what they're talking about, or is it like Bunnings here, where like you ask someone and they have no idea? So it depends on which uh, yeah. person in which aisle. I find there's like right. people who stay around the plumbing aisle who I think used to be plumbers, right? right. They seem to be very knowledgeable and they're like retired plumbers working in the plumbing aisle. Whereas if you go to, uh, I'll put it the younger generation looking people, they tend to be less seemingly like, not always. I've had yeah. some really great interactions with people who know what they're talking about, but generally the, the retired people seem to, the ones that look like they're retired and doing a second career seem to know. Yeah. That's pretty much like about. Bunnings here. Yeah. It's like, like like Bunnings for us is either you're a really young person that knows nothing or you're retired and just looking for something to do a couple of days a week. Um, yeah. But I generally won't ask for help unless I have a product on my phone that I can go, where is this? Okay. Because it's so much easier for me to just Google it in the store than go ask someone. Yeah, right. I'll do that. I'll go on the Home Depot website and find the aisle and bin number and just go find it myself. But I find that the people, like for me, this was just an anecdotal example, but people in the paint aisle were very helpful because like they have to, they have a hands-on job. They have to mix paint all day. So they seem to know, at least in this, you know, setting that they're talking about. I had an interesting experience where like I was designing the backpack that I'm going to make and... I was like, okay, I want the accent pieces that overlap the edge of the fabric to be a certain color. There must be a name for that. But I was lucky in that I have a good friend who studies fashion design. And so I described her exactly what I was talking about. I was like, what is this called? And she says, oh, it's the bias. And now I know. It's an incredibly common (laughs) sewing term. But if you guys have ever gone down the rabbit hole of like sewing terminology, that stuff doesn't come across anywhere else in the world like what is a notion a notion is literally like any object that you would sew into a piece and it's a very common word in the sewing and fashion world and jewelry is the same thing it's like a finding i'm like a finding you mean a finding <laughs> it's like, something that you find and you put in right jewelry. i was so confused i was like i don't what's the finding part well i just want the part that goes in the ear like and and those are like terminology like that. I remember trying to make jewelry and trying to describe jewelry. Like I've written instructables on on jewelry I've made, and I don't I don't think that a jeweler could follow my instructions. But I think you know a, a <laughs> DIY hack like myself could. <laughs> but learn, learning to do all this paracord stuff, and I was watching videos and they're like, so get your jib, and I'm like, what the, what the hell's a jib? It's literally right. a needle. 
it's a, it's like a sewing needle that the paracord will thread into the back of, like the end of, like oh. a screw. But like they call it a jib, and yeah. I'm like, like again, how would I know that? And how would I know to ask for that? Like I'd walk into a store, they'd look at me like, what the hell are you talking about? But to take it back to the paint thing real quick, you say that they need to know what they're doing. I went up to the paint counter because I had to get paint for this TARDIS, and I said, here's the Pantone code. Can you mix me up a sample port of this paint? And he goes, what the hell is a Pantone code? <laughs> And I'm like, That's funny. seriously, like this is your job. And the funny thing is he goes, oh, we can't do that. And I had a picture of someone online who got the exact same paint from another Bunnings and they put up a picture of it, like with the label on the side saying like Bunnings Katara and like the paint code and stuff. And I'm like, here, you can do it. He's literally told me you can do it. And then he somehow did it. I'm like, yeah. But it's, I, I do find that that happens sometimes when you deal with someone, when you're saying things that they don't know, they say they can't do it. And it's one of the most frustrating things when you go into Mm. a shop and you try and explain something to someone, they go, oh, we don't have that there. And it's like, it's because you use the wrong terminology that they all of a sudden they don't have it. And it's because they don't know what you're talking about, but they weren't good. They didn't, they either didn't know their job well enough or they didn't have the right uh, customer service orientation to be able to talk to people and get the information out of what they're looking for. I remember when I was a kid, I was in this like performance shop for cars and a person came in and said, I want clear tail lights. And the guy at the counter said, well, clear tail lights are illegal. He's like, but they have them on Toyota Altezas. Like they have them on cars that are available from the factory with clear tail lights. So this is and like just a clear covering of the light. So like it's yeah, like you take the red and you make it clear, but you have to have some red, right? Okay. For it to be legal yeah, in so Canada. You, so it's a clear like outer case, but then the light inside, like the bulb will be red. Gotcha. It ours in Canada, it has to have some actual red to denote yeah. that it's the so rear. So do ours. Yeah. Yeah. But, anyways, well, technically, it has to, but. Right, they do sell completely clear taillights, right? Because yeah. for a you, if you want to go off road with your car or go to car shows and it never actually drives on the street, you can do stupid things to your car. Anyways, <laughs> so the guy's trying to tell me it's illegal. You can't have clear taillights, and the guy's talking. He's thinking, but Toyota Tesla's come with them, right? Lexus has come with them. What? Why can't I get this for my car? Why is it illegal when a car? Right? And the guy goes. Instead of like trying to, like the guy left frustrated and I all, because I worked in retail at the time, the whole time I was thinking I could just butt in here and like help them out, but I don't, that's not my spot. And I just kept going, try and explain it another way to the guy. He's used one terminology, try and explain it another way. Right. Yeah. Try and get him to show you, show him some pictures of different taillight options and say, this one's illegal. This one is not, right? <laughs> Instead, you had a guy who just walked away. Anyway, six months later, that place went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have that. We don't have that issue here. If you ask for clear taillights, they'll just sell it to you. They don't care if it's illegal. Because as far as they're concerned, you're putting it on a show car. Like we, it, I, I don't know if it's the same there. I know it's not in America, but we, it is completely illegal to have lights under your car, no matter what color they are. Can was that, that thunder? Yeah, it's thunderstorm. That was thunder. Yes, that was thunder. I was like, wow. it sounds like um, you're rubbing your microphone, but I don't see your hand rubbing your microphone. Oh, <laughs> uh, I moved. No, I won't, I won't say that actually. Um, but yeah, so like. It's illegal to have undercar neons, yet I can walk into any auto parts store and buy an undercar neon kit. Yes. So like it, it, it's so dumb. It And the guy would have sold them clear ones for sure. The problem had to do with they were just talking about the same thing but differently, and they just didn't yeah. understand, right? He was like, well, I don't want illegal ones. I see cars with them. Right. Anyways, it was – Yeah. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people do that all the time, right? Like – Especially that's how a lot of arguments happen. It's like you're just saying two different things and not listening to the other person. And like I, I noticed that in my own interactions or in my own relationship. And I'm like, okay, like let's take a step back here. This is what you're trying to say. This is what I'm trying to say. And I, I don't think we're talking about the same thing right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's definitely a big issue in relationships. Right. Well, and it all the different types of relationships. And I think it's yeah. it's 
it's definitely something that when you know the right, when you know the lingo of what you're trying to say, you can make yourself, you can make yourself seem more clear. And I think that's where it goes back to knowing when you need to use sheer strength and when you don't. And knowing when you need to have a clampmendation and when you don't. Clampmendations! All right. Um, I wanted to shout out Kevin Gronk from Person Make Object. Um, he makes some really beautiful craft knives. I think they they have like an interchangeable tip so you can put other things on them. A lot of them are turned wood handles with some really nice brass accents. But um, one of the things that made me want to recommend him is that he made a really cool story in a few videos a little while ago where he was showing um, his whole packaging process and how he makes packaging just with like a laser printer and a laser cutter. Um, and it, it made the whole like that whole process seem very accessible. And as someone who like wants to sell physical products in the future, um, it definitely gave me like a bit of a confidence boost seeing how he was doing it and making it look very nice without needing to work with an external manufacturer of packaging. He was kind of just doing it all in house. Yeah. So if you're just, if you're interested in like making a product, um, from like a small scale manufacturing level, it's definitely a really cool account that you should check out. He's, he's does beautiful work and clearly like puts a lot of care into it. Did he use a lot of lingo mm -hmm. that helped you understand it better? No, it was entirely visual based learning. I don't even think I had the audio oh. on when I was watching his stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to recommend a modern milt. It's an Instagram channel. Um, I actually had the opportunity to meet this person in real life back with the Jackman world tour where he went to both Canada and the United States. <laughs> um, and I uh, actually, that was a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, he's got a really cool Instagram. He does a lot of, uh, kind of like quick, uh, oddly satisfying tips and showing you how like, you know, like cutaways of drywall to show you how dry different drywall anchors work and, you know, how different tools work and all that stuff. Uh, he works in an actual trade. So he actually has every day something that he can show people as opposed to me who only gets out in the garage every once in a while. Um, so he's got tons of uh, different videos out there. So you should go uh, check him out. He also does a lot of reposts of cool stuff around the internet. So I was just going to say, like, he made the Lego vacuum, and then I realized it was a repost from Unnecessary <laughs> Inventions. Which is a necessary invention. I don't understand. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> mate, all mate forgot what he named his um, YouTube channel. Anyway, my, um, my culmination for this week is going to be a Netflix show called Catching Killers. I'm really into, like, crime documentaries and stuff, and there's a really good show that, like, Every episode is about 30 minutes long, but every episode is one case and mm -hmm. they're not cold cases. I can't stand cold cases. I don't know if you guys are the same, but like, yeah, there's no resolution. Yeah. I want, I want the resolution. Like I, there's like a, there's a Netflix show like called cold case killers or something. And like, I will not watch it because I can't stand a cold case. Yeah. That was like the, there's a documentary on Netflix about the, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner museum heist, which was like one of the. I think most expensive art heists in history. Yeah. I watched that. They spill like a Vermeer and a bunch of others. And like growing up in new England, like, you know, this story, you know, that it's unsolved and they made a documentary about it. And I was like, Oh, maybe they'll unearth some new evidence, but it was entirely speculation. And I was like, I'm done with this <laughs> after like two episodes. Like how many times are they going to show yeah. the same low production quality reenactment? I, I was exactly the same. I didn't, I never finished it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you like crime documentaries, have you seen Inventing Anna? No. That's really good. No, I have not. The, um, I think her, what's her name? Julia, Gar not Julia Garner. Yeah, Julia Garner uh, from Ozark. She plays the main character who, it's basically a true story with some fictionalized parts about a woman who poses as a German heiress and kind of, Basically, I mean, she cons her way into a lot of money, but she also like infiltrates the highest social classes of New York City, and I really enjoy oh, yeah. it. It's, I mean, it's directed by Shonda Rhimes, who like is an amazing writer and showrunner. Um, cool, super good. Would highly recommend. Yeah, also. Hmm. Cool. I've seen the the uh, 
the trailer for that and it looks really good yeah i i mean i love like sort of heist i that's how the category i would put it in like heist crime shows like that yeah. well since we don't have a review this week um, if you guys want a review read in the accent of your choice, go on to iTunes or Podcast Addict or wherever else, or just send us a message on Instagram, um, and Morley will read a review of our show in the accent of your choice. If you don't put something, we'll we'll figure out where you're from. Um, but since we don't have that, we're going to do Adam's Australian Word of the Week. Yeah, we're going to do something a little bit different this week. I'm going to read out a full paragraph. And you guys have to tell me what I just said. Okay. So there's a few, like an Australian sentence. All right. Here we go. I met up with Miss Sheila Shazza and her friend Gazza. After going the boat low to get a longie and then went down and got some durries at the local servo. We got a pedo of Winnie Blues. After that, we hung out at the Billabong. Ooh, okay, I think we're gonna have to go through that a line at a time. So I made yeah. out with my Sheila. Is Sheila I, like? I met up with my Sheila Shaza and my fr- and her friend Gaza. Oh my! Okay, gosh. I met okay. up with is my, my Sheila. My, my Sheila, my girlfriend. Not like my girlfriend, gr- just just girl. My girl, the girl I'm seeing at the moment. Like a, a woman. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Like just like my friend, just a friend, just a woman. Okay. Any woman. Got it. Even one you don't know. And then what was the next word? Uh, I met up with me, Sheila Shaza, and her friend Gaza. Oh, her name is Shaza. Yeah. Well. So that's, that's a short a form for another name. Yeah. So uh, I know you you add ah to the end of a lot of words and abbreviate them. So like. Yeah. Shannon. I'll, I'll give you these. So, so Shaza would be Sharon. Okay. Wow. Oh. And Gaza would be Gary. All right. So All right, I met so up with my friend go- Sheila and her friend Gary. Yep. Nope. My friend, Sharon. my friend Sharon and Gary. Okay. After going the bot low to get a longie and then went and got some durries. There's none no, of let's those go, words. No, let's go. After, after going the bot low to get a longie. All right. The bot There's low, too many like, words in there that don't bottle make shop any to sense. get a tall can of beer, like a tall <laughs> vessel of alcohol. Yeah. So, okay. So, so a longie would be like a long neck, which is like, I don't know. I don't know Regular like beer. Boom, got got beer. it. One. Bottle, bottle O is a bottle shop. Got okay. it. Like a shop. Okay. And then when it got some durries at the local servo. Cigarettes at a convenience store? Well, servo is a service station, like a petrol station. We got a yeah. pedo of Winnie Blues after we hung out at the Billabong. A, a pedo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are Winnie Blues a type of cigarette? They are. So like a package or a carton? Yeah, pa- a pack. And I swear you and said you, Billabong you, before. You know Billabong. We've done Billabong before. Yeah, that's like a really common one. Grant, do you remember that one? I There's nothing of this that makes any sense to me. So Okay. So essentially, all I just said is I met up with my friends Sharon and Gary. We went and got a long neck bottle of beer from the from the bottle shop. We went and bought some cigarettes on the servo and then hung out at the water hole. At the watering hole? The water hole? Water hole, not watering hole. Not a, not a pub, like just like a like local lake. Gotcha. Cool. All right, we're getting we're getting good. Right. We're getting almost fluent in Australian. <laughs> I would say completely the opposite. I say if anything, I've gotten worse after today. If, I would like to go back to a single word, and I'd like we to will, sometimes sometimes this, ask this, for it to be used this, in a sentence. Yes, this came up on a TikTok, and I'm like, I need to do this whole sentence. Nice. Yes. Well, thank you very much for breaking my brain. <laughs> if you guys out there would like to find us, you can find us on Instagram at the at Clampcast on YouTube uh, by searching for uh, Clamp Adam Morley Grant, and we will show up. Or we're on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, you know, and Patreon. Um, 
So I want to thank the Patreon supporters. I think I, I forgot <laughs> I to put that. Was like, Did you say that? <laughs> Did I say Oh, I'm so sorry, Patreon supporters. We you, love you. you had that amazing segue before. I had the amazing segue in the Patreon, and someone usually moves it around for me, but they didn't. Um, I want to thank the Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to the F-Clamp level, uh, Brent Jarvis from Clean Cut Woodworking, and Vincent Ferrari from the Because We Make podcast, um, as well as all the rest of the people who support us. Every Everyone who supports us gets access to the pre-show and the after show. Um, we also give out keychains. And I saw on Instagram, I think it was yesterday, that our latest Patreon got their number two keychain uh, when the first one got yeah. stolen by the mail. Um, and uh, if you're interested in that, go on over to uh, patreon.com slash clamp. Um and you can find all the information there for signing up. And uh, if you don't want to do that, we understand. Um, if you you know just listening is good enough for us, or you can uh, share the show or write a review, and those would both be appreciated. Until next time, I will time, say. Wait, I will say we've had some banger pre-show and after shows recently. So true. Some some might say they're better than the show. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's what I thought last week. And then we got all these really nice messages about the episode. So I don't know. Are you uh, not a good judge of yourself? We may never know. Yeah, we're never, I'm never a good judge of myself. That's for sure. Uh, anyways, until next time, hope you all have a great day and uh, cheers. Bye. See you. Hello and welcome to Clamp, the weekly podcast where we talk about everything related to creating, living, and making projects. I'm your host, the Grant Alexander, and joining me, as always, is Mackie. <laughs> what? And <laughs> oh fuck, I'm gonna do that again. I was like, oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Clamp, the creating. Nope. Hello and welcome to Clamp. <laughs>